Well, back in December of 1986, Claudia and I went to Puerto Rico, uh, and we were supposed to stay at the DuPont Hotel, uh, which was actually one of the nicest hotels in all of San Juan at that time. Uh, but when we got there, there was a booking error, and so we couldn't stay there, and so we had to stay at a lesser hotel down the road. And at 3.30 p.m. on December 31st, a fire started in the casino of the DuPont Hotel by disgruntled employees who were involved in a labor dispute with the owners. And it claimed the lives of 96 people and it injured another 140. And as far as my family was concerned and as far as Claudia's family was concerned and what they knew is that we were staying at the DuPont. That's what they thought. Uh, and they were worried. They were worried and deeply concerned and, and there was no way to contact us. They didn't have the number. Uh, where we were staying, there were no phone calls that could go out, uh, there was no contact uh, information or able to get in, in touch with us, uh, and so they had no idea what was going on. And again, there was no cell phones, no email, no Instagram, no Facebook, none of that stuff existed. Uh, so, so we couldn't tell them that we were okay until the end of that day. And I'm sure it was really good news for them when they were able to get in touch with us and we with them to find that, that we were doing okay. It must have been a tremendous sigh of relief. Well, Paul has been separated from the Thessalonian saints now for quite some time. Uh, and, and he was only with them for a short time before he had a race out of Thessalonica because he was run out of town due to persecution. And he tried and he tried and he tried to return to them, but he said in chapter 2, verse 18, that Satan had hindered him. Uh, and, he, and he wanted to get back because he loved them and he was concerned uh, that the, the afflictions they were under could somehow shipwreck their faith. Or that they would have given ear to Paul's enemies who were slandering him and again, maybe abandoned the faith. And it was tormenting him not knowing how they who he had shared the gospel with and they who professed to believe in the gospel were doing. So he says in chapter 3, verses 1 to 3, Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of God to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. So he sent Timothy in the hope that he would return to him while he was in Corinth and he would bring him good news, good news about the Thessalonians' faith. Well, in verses 6 to 10, Timothy does return to Paul, and he does indeed bring him good news. And I'd like to consider this good news in these verses in a sermon titled, Bringing Good News, and I want to consider it in two ways. The first way is the comfort from good news, and secondly, the thankfulness for good news. Comfort, thankfulness. And let's look at the comfort from good news in verses 6 to 8. I'll read them again. But now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought to us good news of your faith and love, and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. Well, he begins verse 6 with the words, but now. But now. And but now is a contrast to verse 5 where Paul said he couldn't bear it any longer, uh, that he, he, he had to know what was going on with the Thessalonians' faith. Uh, for fear that somehow Satan had tempted them uh, and that his labor was in vain. Uh, so Paul was waiting for Timothy to come to him in Corinth with good news. He was waiting with bated breath. Uh, and, and he was very unsettled in his soul as he waited for him to give him the report of, of the state of the Thessalonians. I remember back when I was about 16 years old and I had taken my road test. And back in those days, you didn't find out like right then and there whether you passed or failed. You had to wait two weeks for the, for the motor vehicle department to write you a letter and say you passed or you failed. Some of you guys know what I'm saying, right? So you had to wait two weeks. And, and all I could remember was every day after school, I would race home, get to that mailbox, open it up and say, maybe today's the day. I couldn't stand waiting. And it did take two weeks. And I did pass the first time. Uh, and so, so there's this great anticipation. Well, Paul couldn't take the suspense. Uh, and now Timothy has come to him with the report. And I'm sure Timothy, right? And I'm sure he doesn't dilly-dally. I make a couple of stops here and there between you know, Thessalonica and Corinth, because he knows that this is important to Paul. Paul wants to know. He sends him saying, I can't take it, I need to know. So I'm sure he hustled muscle to bring them the good news. Well, Timothy comes and Paul says, he brought us good news. And good news is the Greek word for evangelize. 
It is to proclaim glad tidings. And this word is almost always used for the preaching of the gospel. And this is the only time Paul uses it not specifically for the gospel. And the reason may be, uh, the may be for, for him hearing the good news of the Thessalonians' faith was as if he had heard the good news of the gospel itself. So it was like the blessing of the gospel to Paul. While the good news Timothy brought back was not political, was not financial, was not physical, but it was spiritual. It's about the spiritual state of the Thessalonian saints. Uh, and it was that they were clinging to Christ. They had not given in to the immense pressure of their afflictions that they were under. They had not given in. They had not abandoned ship. And Paul lists four things that this good news consisted of. It was their faith. It was their love. It was that the Thessalonians had a good remembrance of him. And finally, that they greatly desired to see him. So first, he brought back news about their faith. That it was genuine faith. That it was saving faith. Paul praised the Thessalonians in chapter 1, verse 3, for their work of faith. And then in chapter 1, verse 8, that their faith in God had gone out to every place. So their faith worked. Their faith worked. They were about good works that go with true faith, right? Faith without works is dead. Well, they had works that followed their faith. And they also shared their faith. We read all over Greece, which made their faith evident to others. So although people came against them socially and financially and physically, their faith was not shaken. Right? They weren't the seed that fell on the stony ground and sprang up fast and then was all of a sudden scorched by the sun, right? Or so they didn't claim to believe in Christ, but when trials and troubles came their way, uh, because of the word, they went away. That wasn't the Thessalonians. So these Thessalonians counted the cost. They didn't budge from trusting in Christ. They believed the gospel. They believed the promises of the word of God. They knew they were sinners and that they knew they were once alienated from God and destined for destruction. And when they heard the good news of the gospel, they wholeheartedly embraced it. They wholeheartedly embraced it. And because a work of regeneration was done in them, they were given the gifts of, of faith and the gift of repentance. They had as Psalm 36, 7 says, put their trust under the shadow of his wings. They were like those in Psalm 121, 1, who put their trust in the Lord and on a like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved and abides forever. Because their trust was in the Lord, as Jeremiah 17, 8 says, they shall be like a tree planted by waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. So they were the fulfillment of what Paul was commissioned to do, which was to go to the Gentiles, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Acts 28, 16, 18. And because their faith, uh, their faith in God was real, uh, Paul could rest. Uh, he could rest. He now knew, as 1 Peter 1, 5 says, that they were kept by the power of God unto salvation. So their perseverance through trials and hardships was an evidence that their faith was real. Well, because their faith was real, so too was their love. And this is the second piece of the good news, that they had love. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 1.3 that they labored in love. Well, their love labored. And labored means to sweat, to work hard to the point of exhaustion. So they broke a sweat caring for the saints. They went the extra yard in serving God because of their great love for him. They served God because they loved God. So their love for God and for Christ and for the brethren and for the lost was a reality. Uh, and the reason they so loved and, and so labored the way they did is because God so loved them. And they couldn't help but love them back and others. When God loves you and you know God loves you and that love saturates your heart, that the only thing that is possible to come from you is love for him, right? Jesus said, you love me because I loved you first. And this is a supernatural love. And it's produced by the Spirit of God in a man. So it's a, it's a fruit of the Spirit. 
And the order of faith and love here is important because he says faith first and then love. Uh, because we can't truly love before we truly believe. Right? We need faith in God to know who he is and to know his love for us so that we can love back. We need to know who God is and who Christ is and what he has done for us on our behalf it, that, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That God so loved us that he gave, gave us his only begotten son to be a sacrifice for our sins. So, so without faith, it's impossible to please God and really it's impossible to love God. 1 John 4, 8 says, He who does not love does not know God for God is love. But as our faith grows, our love grows. And, and, and as we love him more and more, our trust in him gets stronger and stronger and our faith grows. Also, they're two sides of the same coin. You, you can't have one without the other. You can't say, oh, I have faith, but you don't have love. Or I say, oh, I love God, but you don't have faith. You don't believe in him. You don't trust in his word. They go together. Right? They, they are really the two evidences that a saving work has been done on a person. A and persecution and hardship cannot derail that. John Calvin said of faith and love, he said, in these two words... He states concisely the sum of total godliness. Paul said in Galatians 6, 5, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. So doing external things or not doing them can, can, can earn an ounce of favor with God, cannot earn an ounce of favor with God in any way at all. But what he delights is, is faith working through love. And faith and love in the saints is what blesses a pastor's heart. Because where there is faith and love, well, there's repentance. And there's forgiveness. And there's unity among the body. And there is much one anothering going on. Uh, and there is heartfelt worship in the body. And there is evangelistic zeal. And there is using of spiritual gifts. So in a nutshell... There is Christ-like living and much glory being given to God where there is faith and love. Now, the third piece of the good news that Timothy brings back uh, is that the Thessalonian saints always have a good remembrance of us. They didn't forget Paul. They didn't forget his gospel partners. And they weren't swayed by those who were slandering Paul. And even though their time with Paul was really short, it was extremely sweet and it bared much fruit, and their hearts were bonded to Paul's heart. He was their spiritual father and they were his spiritual children. And they loved him. Right? They saw how God used him to save them. So you don't forget those people that God blesses you with, who God uses in your life to either save you or to grow you as a, as a young believer. You have fondness for them. You have sweet memories of them. Back in 1995, I met Pastor Paul Fry, and many of you who come to the Bible study have met Pastor Paul Fry. And I was young in my faith, and he encouraged me in my faith, and he counseled me, and he spent a lot of time with me. And he showed me what a Christian should look like and how a Christian should live. And after 27 years, and that's how long I know him, I have a great fondness for him in my heart. So Timothy brought good news, good news of the Thessalonians' faith, their love, their remembrance of Paul, and lastly, that they greatly desired to see him. And greatly desired means to long for greatly. Have a tremendous longing for. And the Greek word uh, was used in the Septuagint or the Old Testament in Psalm 42, and you're familiar with this, as the deer pants, pants, greatly desire, pants for the water brook, so, so pants my soul for you, O God. Same word. And greatly desired is in the present tense, so the Thessalonian saints continually longed to see Paul. They continually longed to see him. They clearly cherished the memories of their time with Paul and were greatly desirous of his fellowship again. So this was good news to Paul. As Proverbs 25, 25 says, as cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. And this was good news. Uh, so this good news was very refreshing to Paul's soul. And the question is, do you bring good news to the saints? Do you bring good news to the saints? Do you remind them of the great things that God has done for them and is doing in their lives and, and, in, and in your own life? Uh, do you share with them the blessings of the saints, how God is working in our body? 
And, and do you bring good news of the gospel to the lost? That's a very encouraging thing as well. Hey, they are bombarded with news that cannot help their souls. News that can't help them on the day of judgment. News that fuels hatred and divi division and greed and pride. But you have good news. You have the good news. The good news of the gospel. News that can save their soul. News that can give them eternal life. Well, because of the good news Paul received from Timothy, he said in verse 7, Therefore, brethren, in all our afflictions and distress, we were comforted concerning your faith. So even though Paul had aff affliction and distress in his life, he was comforted by the news of the Thessalonians' faith. And affliction means oppressing, a pressure. It has the idea of being squeezed or crushed beneath a tremendous weight. An ancient mode of torture uh, in Southeast Asia was to crush someone to death by literally having an elephant sit on them. That's torture. And I believe it would be. Distress means calamity. It literally means it must needs be. It literally. Or it is necessary. So, so it means to be compelled. So preaching the gospel in, in, in a hostile territory brings calamity. Yet Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of. For necessity, there's the word, necessity, that's the stress, is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Woe to me. Paul also had the had the afflictions and distresses of the Jews constantly stirring up the crowds against him wherever he went. While he testified that Jesus was the Christ in Corinth, he said in Acts 18 to the Jews that opposed him, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. For now I will go to the Gentiles. Then in verse 13, Right? The Jews made a united at attack on him and, and brought him before a tribunal. Uh, so, so although Paul had constant afflictions and distresses, the good news of the Thessalonians, that they brought him, that brought him great comfort. Just as he was comforted by the coming of Titus with his report on the Corinthians. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5-7, to 7, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside were conflicts. Inside were fears. Nevertheless, God comforts the downcast. Comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not only by his coming, but also by the consolation with which he was comforted in you. When he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. You repented of your sin and you wanted to see me again. So Paul was encouraged by by Timothy's good news here in, in 1 Thessalonians, so much so that his pressure and troubles didn't dampen him. That's what he's saying. Yeah, I got troubles. I got plenty of troubles. But when I heard that good news that, that Timothy brought, oh, I was comforted. I was comforted. Right? He was comforted. It didn't dampen him. It didn't dampen him. He was comforted that they were walking in the truth. 2 John 1. He was confident that they obeyed the truth through the Spirit, 1 Peter 1.22. Paul drew strength from the comfort of these new believers. And, and, and because they were facing their trials, it made it easier for Paul to face his. He was actually comforted in their faith and in God's faithfulness. And is it not comforting to us, regardless of whatever our hardships are, to see young believers not buckle under pressure? to hear their testimonies, how God has delivered them from this trial or from that trial. Do we not gain comfort from the saints, the, the saints' commitment to Christ even amidst whatever their trials are and their suffering is? Are you not encouraged when you read about the saints in the Ukraine, what they're going through, that their cities are being bombed and they're gathering together and praying and praying that they would not lose heart? And that's not just the Ukraine, all over the world. Listen, we don't know how good we have it here and how easy we have it compared to so much of the world. Where it, it's, 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 potentially, it's potentially breaking the law. It is breaking the law to even meet to own Bibles and to come together. And churches are burned down and pe people are imprisoned and yet they meet together and they ask us to pray that they would not lose heart, that they would not grow faint or weary. 
Isn't that comforting to us? And they still evangelize. They get the gospel out in remote places. It should comfort us. Well, Paul was greatly comforted by the saints at Thessalonica. And, and they gave him a renewed strength, a, a freshness of life, if you will. Which is why he says in verse 8, For now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And when he says, for now we live, it's not like he wasn't alive before. Of course he was. But rather, he was struggling. He was troubled in his soul, not knowing the state of their faith. Uh, he was in a dark place. Uh, there was a deadness about him, so to speak. There was a moroseness. Oh, are they in the faith? Are they not in the faith? And, and the news that Timothy uh, brings him kind of fans the embers of his soul, so to speak. And, and this, this, this news put life back into his ministry. His life was bound up in the Lord and in the Lord's people. And this was like a shot of 20,000 milligrams of vitamin C to his soul. Uh, so it picked him up. It renewed his vigor. I remember, I don't know how many years ago, maybe five years ago or so, when Kelvin Candelario came to Grace Baptist Church. And his zeal for evangelism and his hunger for the lost to know Christ, it stirred up my heart. Uh, my heart once again for, to, to share the gospel with the lost. You see, I used to have a burden for the lost. I used to be very evangelistic and had a real zeal for souls, but my heart had grown cold. And I had become complacent. I just was not doing it. And then Kelvin shows up and he's got all this zeal for the lost and all of a sudden it's like, it's like the, the, the light is like, like hitting me. And it flicks me again. So his zeal stirred up my zeal again. And praise God for that. Well, Paul said, he said, we live if... And if is a qualifier here. And the qualifier is, if you stand fast in the Lord. If you don't budge, if you don't crack under pressure, if you don't abandon the faith like Demas did, who loved this present world. If. And stand fast means refusal to move. It was a military term which meant refusal to retreat under attack. It means to persevere. Uh, and, and Jesus said the saints need to persevere. Matthew 10, 22, he said, he who endures to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. Well, he who doesn't won't be. But he who does shows himself to be the real deal. Not like you're losing your salvation. It shows you never really had it. Paul exhorted the saints in 1 Corinthians 16 to watch, stand fast. There it is. Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. All right? In 1 Corinthians in Philippians 1.27, Paul said, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. Let me hear it, that you're standing fast, you're not budging, you're staying on the gospel, you're clinging to Christ, right? You've got your arms around the cross, you're not moving. We read in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, this is what he said to these, these same saints. Stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. So don't let trials or suffering or the world or the devil cripple your faith. Stand fast. Stand fast. And stand fast, by the way, is in the present tense, uh, which means we're called to continually be standing fast, continually be, be anchoring in and not budging. Don't give an inch. Don't give an inch. Continually dig in your heels against all that the enemy will throw at you. Therefore, stand fast against temptations to sexual immorality. Stand fast. Stand fast against the allurements of pornography. Stand fast. No, I will not look at it. No, I will not click that button. No, I will not take a second look. I will not let that run in my mind. No, stand fast. Stand fast against covetousness, desiring to have what other people have. Stand fast against wanting to be rich and famous and anything else. Stand fast being content with whatever God gives you. Stand fast against caught, getting caught up in the political chaos that is all around us of our day. Stand fast against the fear of man or the fear of a virus or maybe one of the 200 variants. They cannot kill you ultimately. Stand fast against the voices telling you that Christ can't help you. is not enough or that the Bible doesn't have what you need. Stand fast. The Bible is sufficient for any and all of our struggles or troubles. Amen? Amen. Stand fast. Don't get knocked around. Don't be beguiled by every wind of doctrine. Don't let pressure or distress or struggles 
cause you to slip. Don't let the multitude of temptations that come your way shake your faith. Don't be listening to the world. Brothers and sisters, you are a new creation. You're not the old man anymore. That person died in Christ and you've been risen to a new man. And that new man takes his or her orders, if you will, or direction from Christ. And you get that in his word. You need and I need a biblical worldview. And I am telling you, you did not have a biblical worldview before you were saved. And maybe even after you're saved, you don't have one until you learn it. How do you think about moral issues? How do you think about marriage? How do you think about money? How do you think about anything? Relationships, any of that stuff. How do you think about it? Well, God's got a, an answer, a biblical way to view it. The world's view, I'm telling you, is contrary 180 from God's view in all of those things. We've got to grow in a biblical worldview. Don't get knocked around by those things. Don't let them sway you or shake your faith. Stand your ground. Don't give an inch. Stand firm in the gospel because it never changes. Because God never changes. And stand fast in living for him because at the end of it all, guess what? Heavenly glory. Heavenly glory. So first we see be comforted. The comfort from good news. Secondly, thankfulness for good news. Verses 9 and 10. For what thanks can we render to God for you? for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before God, night and day, praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. Well, Paul says how the good news or their steadfastness in the faith comforted him. And now he says you just can't help but give God thanks for them. You can't help it. He says, for what thanks can we render to God? So he's thankful for the Thessalonians weren't weren't tempted away by the tempter, uh, that they didn't walk away from the faith. And and listen, Paul was an extremely thankful man. You can't read the scriptures and not see that. In Romans 6.14, he gave God thanks for Priscilla and Aquila who risked their lives for him. 2 Corinthians 8, he thanked God that Titus had his kind of care for the Corinthians. Uh, And he gave God thanks for the Ephesians and for the Colossians and everyone else he wrote to. He told the saints in Colossians 3, whatever you do in word or deed, Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. We should be thankful. We should be thankful for all things. It is really very sad. It is a a contradiction for a Christian not to be thankful. We have a lot to be thankful for, but we get holed up and caught up in our struggles and our our pains and our suffering and and the ills around us. And we can complain and, and get caught up in fear. And yet we have a ton to be thankful for, right? Well, we got out of bed today. Foot hit the ground. God has given us breath in our lungs, the opportunity to come and praise him with others. The hope of the gospel never changes, right? We should be thankful. And so he's thankful that they weren't moved away. Uh, And he'll say in this this same book, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says, in everything, everything, give thanks. Here it is. For this is the will of God in Christ. It's God's will we thank him. He wants us to be a thankful people, to recognize every good thing comes from him and then thank him for it. Not that he needs our thanks. Not that we somehow enhance his glory. We don't. But it grows us, makes us more dependent upon him when we say thank you. I didn't do this. It was my smarts that got me here or my abilities that made this money or, you know, my, uh, my know-how and, you know, that, that made this happen. No, God did it. But he did it through me and he did it through you. He uses us to do those things. He wants us to be thankful. So Paul was a very thankful man and he was thankful for the Thessalonians' faith. But notice also, he is thankful for what thanks can we render to God for you? Right, for what thanks? So, so he wasn't, he wasn't, Thanking the Thessalonians for their faith, right? Oh, Nick, I thank you that you're so, such a faithful man. No. I'll say, I thank, God. I, I thank God for you, but I don't thank you, right? What thanks can we render to God for you? So he's thanking God. Because faith is not something any man can muster up himself. It can, it's not. It is the gift of God, and you know that. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, good verses to put to memory. For by grace you have been saved through faith. All right, grace is gift, and the vehicle is faith. 
And they're both gifts. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You didn't save yourself. You didn't figure it out. You didn't give yourself grace. You didn't give yourself faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, if you didn't figure that out. It is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. So the whole, you got to come to Christ, you got to believe in Him, this wipes that out. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Why? Lest anyone should boast. You could boast if you got yourself saved, right? You could say, look at me, man. I finally uh, picked up my bootstraps and came around, and here I am. I did it. You did nothing. You were dead. God made you alive. God gave you grace. God is sustaining you. God is keeping you. His spirit is in you. And he's giving you everything you need until you get the glory. God did it. Hebrews 12, 2 asks, uh, says, says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of faith. He started it. He'll complete it. Paul asks in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? Think about it. Maybe your good looks. He gave it to you. Maybe your keen mind. He gave it to you. Your faith. He gave it to you, right? What do you have? Well, the answer is rhetorical. It's a rhetorical question. Nothing. Nothing. So God is the giver of faith in every good thing. And he alone should be thanked for those things, like repentance uh, and your life in the kingdom and your growth in faith and your steadfastness in the faith. He gets thanked for that. Thank him for opening up your heart to the message of the gospel. He could have left it closed, right? We see in Acts, uh, in Acts 16, a bunch of women are down praying by the, by the river, but he opens one woman's heart to heed the things and believe the things that Paul is speaking. That's Lydia. doesn't say he opened up everybody's heart. Opened up Lydia's heart. Praise God and thank God he opened up your heart if it's open, right? He gets the thanks. So Paul is thankful uh, that, that, he, that God had preserved the Thessalonian saints and then he knew that it was God and God alone who saved them and who kept them uh, and and who he was thankful for that, to God. And yes, Paul was a pastor and a Bible teacher, uh, and, and he was certainly used by God in their lives, clearly. All right? And all Christians are used by God to share the gospel with the lost, to disciple young believers. Right? Yes, we are the tools, the means that God uses, but it is 100% of God's grace. So there's no room for pride or feeling good about yourself. No one can take an ounce of credit for anything. Your gifting, your natural abilities, your intellect, your opportunities are all God-given. Your spiritual gifts are God-given. So if you have more of something than someone else has, that's because God gave it to you. And if you have less, it's because God didn't want to give you what he gave him. And what do we say to that? Amen. Amen. Well, Paul says, what thanks can be rendered? to God for you. And render means to repay. And again, it's a rhetorical question because there's nothing anybody could do. No amount of thanks you can give uh, that, would, that, would, that would be sufficient for the gift of faith that God has given. Yet, what it does say about the Christian uh, who does not continually thank God uh, for their salvation is that they're not really thankful. The psalmist asked in Psalm 116, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What shall I, what shall I render to him? Right? Well, just because we can't render perfect thanksgiving doesn't mean we shouldn't be continually thanking him. Well, I can't do this perfect, so I'm just not going to do it. We should have a thankful spirit. And by the way, that really is another one of the marks of a real believer, especially among unbelievers. You're like thankful when you're struggling, right? When there's pain and suffering, you've taken a financial blow or you have all kinds of sh trouble in your home, and you have a thankful spirit, you know what the world says? That ain't right. That ain't normal. What's wrong with you, man? You should be mad. Get even. Throw a fit. Kick him out. Right? I mean, that's what the world would say. And you say, no, I thank God. I thank God for my husband. I thank God, you know, that, that, that he's put us in this scenario because it's his, his sovereign will. I praise God for my sickness. I praise God that my ears buzz like there's the bells of St. Mary's like 24-7. It's his will. And he's growing me in it. And he's growing you in whatever he's giving you. Right? So what, what, what shall I render to the Lord? Well, Hebrews 13, 15 says, Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And Romans 12, 1 says, We should offer our bodies, our bodies as a living sacrifice. Meaning, Lord, I'm yours. Do what you want. 
What you say, I will do. Where you send, I will go. Right? I give it all. I mean, that's what, that's what, that's giving thanks. So Paul is filled with thanksgiving in his heart. So he will thank God. Uh, and he's thankful for all the joy which he rejoices in for their sake before God. And Paul was so filled with joy over the Thessalonians' steadfast in the, steadfastness in the faith that, he was, that, that, that the overflow brought God thanksgiving. And some find it easy to rejoice in someone else's like financial benefits or blessings. They have a baby, you are so thankful, right? Uh, they get married, big celebration, we're so thankful, and we should be. Right? Well, well, we should be, right? We should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We should be. But Paul rejoiced over the Thessalonians' spiritual prosperity. They could have been, they, they were a very poor people. And we'll see that, uh, I might preach for 2 Corinthians, we'll see that, uh, that area, they were dirt poor, all right? And they suffered greatly in that area. But he's thankful for their spiritual prosperity, right? He rejoiced that they were walking with Christ, that they found their satisfaction in him, right? That they were willing to suffer for his sake. He was thankful they were willing to suffer for his sake, and, and we have to suffer for his sake as well, but not like some of our brothers and sisters around the world suffer for his sake. And, and we should be thankful that the brothers and sisters are, are standing firm and that you would be standing firm and that I would be standing firm and be thankful because that just brings God glory. It honors who he is. And a pastor who is faithful will be thankful because of the joy of what God is doing in the hearts of his people. And do you know, do you know what should delight the heart of a pastor? It's not a good treasurer's report. Right? It's not that Benny's going to bring us like a good report and we say, oh, good, the money's good. And right? it's not that. It's not that, that, that we get a big and beautiful building, right? That we have more programs, how many ministries we have, how popular we are. And that. But his delight should be, his delight should be in the precious souls that God has put in his care and he sees how... They are growing more and more in trusting in God and living for Him. That should be the delight of the pastor's heart. Not the physical stuff, right? Not how you prosper in the world. I, mean, I want you to prosper. I really do. I mean, I think it's good. You know, prosper and do it in the Lord and, 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 and be all the more of a blessing in the kingdom. But that you would be growing. And you know where I hear it? I hear it in the prayers. I hear it in the prayers of the saints. And oftentimes in just in, 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 in how they're waiting upon him, even, even through the trials. And trials aren't a bad thing, you know. Trials are actually a tremendous blessing in the, in the, in the Christian life because they burn away the, the, the garbage, the dross, and they, they purify the gold. They burn away the us in us, and what they leave is more of Christ. So they're a good thing. They don't feel good, and, you know, we don't, we don't particularly like them, uh, but God is using them to make us more into the people he wants us to be. And so, so it's a delight to the pastor to see how the people are growing and how the saints love the saints and how the saints serve the saints. It is a joy for me to hear how you are trusting in the Lord through your struggles. It is joyful to me to say from this pulpit, Jose needs help on Sunday mornings and the next Sunday, four people show up at 7.30 to help him. And by the way, he still needs help. But it's a joy to me. It is a joy to me when someone says to me, you can use my house for ministry. Take my car, however you need it. How can I help someone? Pastor, I got a couple of bucks I want to give it to someone who really needs it. That just says to me, you care. Right? I mean, it, it, I rejoice in that. I rejoice when you put yourself out for others because I know that's the Lord working in you. Well, because Paul is thankful for the great joy he's received because of the Thessalonians' faith, he says he prays exceedingly for them, night and day. And exceedingly means super abundantly, beyond measure. When the rich young ruler walked away from Jesus because he loved his money and didn't love the Lord, um, Jesus said to his disciples after that, he said, you know, it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And in Mark 10, 26, we read his disciples' response. We read, and they were greatly astonished exceedingly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? 
They were astonished beyond measure. That's what he's saying. Astonished beyond measure. Well, Paul's praying day and night means he prayed always for them. Uh, and, and the sense here is that he prayed with intensity. A and he prayed intensely for two things. One, that he would see their face. And two, that he would perfect what was lacking in their faith. Uh, and and, and he, was, he was thrilled in his soul with the news Timothy brought back. But that wasn't enough. He still wanted to see their face. And there are no substitutes, no substitutes to being with the saints and worshiping with the saints. There are no substitutes. Facebook Live, Zoom, uh, whatever else there is. All the, the, the technical stuff where we can, we can see each other on, on a screen and talk to each other and pray or whatever. It's good in its place and we're thankful for it, but it pales in comparison to being with the body. Listen, we're commanded to continually assemble together. Not every month, every couple of weeks, once every six weeks. All the time, when, when the saints come together, we should come. And it's not just a good idea. You can't read Hebrews 10.25 and get around it. Right? We're commanded to not neglect the assembling of ourselves together. Right? And that's a command. So God wants us to corporately do together what we are supposedly doing privately day by day. And if you just do a little word study on the word assemble in the New Testament, you will see over and over again the saints assemble. They assemble. They come together. And that's what Paul wanted. He wanted to assemble with the saints in Thessalonica. He wanted to see them. He wanted to be around them. He didn't want to just be sending letters and getting information from, from you know, Timothy or others. He wanted to see them. And then he said he doesn't want anyone to see them. He wants to perfect what was lacking in their faith. And the word perfect does not mean to be sinless, but rather to be mature. It means to grow up, to be strengthened. And the reason they needed to be strengthened is because there were things that they were still lacking. And all Christians are lacking in some spiritual areas. I am and you are as well. None of us knows all things. None of us lives perfectly. Paul himself said that. He said of himself in Philippians 3, not that I have already attained or am perfected, I'm not. So anyone that says or believes in this false doctrine called sinless perfection, throw it out the door. Because Paul says in Philippians 3.12, I'm not even that. We can't be. Otherwise, why would God give us so many commands to live holy? Because we don't always live holy. And 2 Peter 3.18 calls us to grow in the grace and knowledge of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we need to grow. We're commanded to grow. We all need to grow. We all need to mature more and more. Uh, and, and the means of maturing is primarily through the Word. Through the Word. Not just any Word, but His Word, rightly divided. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. You see, we grow as we increase in our knowledge and understanding of the Word of God and applying it. It's no good to be this big head of knowledge and you don't do it. Right? It's no good to know a lot of biblical stuff and then you don't live it. Actually, Paul says that puffs up. That's just prideful. So everything we know, we've got to pray, Lord, help me do this, help me be this, help me think this. We pray. We pray. So we grow as we hear and believe and apply. So if you're a reader of the Word and a meditator on the Word and a prayer of the Word, and you take advantage of the venues to hear and learn, particularly here, but other ways as well, and then ask God to help you to live what you learn, you will mature. You will grow. You will grow in your faith. But if you are scarcely in the Word, you dabble here and there, maybe this is the only Word you'll get this week, if that's the case, and you don't meditate on the Word, you just do the fly-by reading, and like, all right, I got my chapter in, I am done. Start my day. But if you don't meditate on it, chew on it, mull it over, let it marinate, so to speak, and you're not praying at all, well, you're stunted in your growth. And that's, that's cause for concern. Right? It's cause for concern. And then also you become an easy target. You become an easy target for the tempter. When, when, when the shield of faith is low, when you don't have the sword of the Spirit, you know, wielding out there, the potential for those fiery darts to hit the head and hit the heart, they're there. 
you know, and, 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 and we could easily get shot down by the tempter. So let us praise God, though, for opening our hearts and birthing us into his kingdom and for his wonderful word and the many opportunities he gives us to grow in it. We have many opportunities to grow in the word, and thank God for it, right? Well, in closing, let me ask you one question and leave you with just one thought. And the question is this, what is lacking in your faith? What is lacking in your faith? As I said, we all have things uh, which we are lacking in our faith. So what is lacking in your faith? May I suggest asking a brother or a sister to be honest with you and share with you what they think is lacking in your faith because a lot of times it's hard for us to see it. But it might be easier for someone who's close to us and cares about us to say, you know what? You know, I think that you don't trust in this area and I think you're a little bad or whatever, right? What is lacking? Ask a brother or a sister or maybe a family member who be honest with you. Now, don't be upset when they tell you, by the way. I can't believe you said that. Well, they think that, right? What is lacking? And then I would ask you, once you do that, what are you doing to grow where you are lacking? Oh, now I know. I'm full of pride, I'm lazy, or whatever else it is. I mean, you know, the list probably could be long. All right, now you know. Thank God you know. But what are you going to do? You're going to leave it there. Right? What are you doing right, to grow where you are lacking? Right? And so if you're weak in understanding doctrine, come to Pastor Phil, come to myself, come, come to someone else who, who is well-equipped in that area. If you're weak in trusting God through trials, I've got to tell you, many saints here can come alongside of you in that area because they've gone through many and God has kept them. Talk to them. If you're weak in evangelism or battling temptations or loving your spouse or anything else, again, ask the brothers or sisters to pray for you, to hold you accountable, to help you, show you in the scriptures where God has answers because he does have answers. Show you in the scriptures where God has answers to help you. There are verses that are like, they're like, they're like medicine to the soul, when, especially when you're going through trials. Ask where the Bible has answers. Remember, 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, our, sanctifi our sanctification, our growth, it's the will of God. God wants you to grow. He didn't save you to be a baby. He saved you to grow. He saved me to grow. Now, my one thought is this. Jesus had great joy because of us in all of his afflictions and his distresses. Hebrews 12.2 says, For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the, right hand of the throne of God. So in the midst of the greatest trial ever fought against the fiercest enemies known to man, Jesus had joy in his inner man, knowing that he had to drink the cup of God's wrath, knowing that he had to pay the full price of your sins for your eternal forgiveness and redemption, knowing all of that, knowing that he had to suffer your damnation. He had joy in his inner man. And part of his joy as 1 Peter 3.8 tells us, was knowing that he was bringing you to God. And part of his joy, John 17 tells us, is that you would behold his glory in glory. And part of his joy, Hebrews 2.10 says, is that he would bring many sons to glory. It was that we would be guiltless in the day of glory. So it says 1 Corinthians 1. And Isaiah 53.10 uh, 12 says that his joy was that in the end he would divide the spoils of his victory with his people. He would divide the spoils, right, that's glory and eternal life, right, with his people. With his people. And his joy, as Psalm 24, 9 and 10 says, is that the king of glory, who is Jesus, would come back for his people and bring them with him to heaven as the angels open the gates to let them enter with him. Can you imagine that? He's going to say, open. Psalm 24 is a beautiful psalm about Christ going into glory. First coming, his, first is his ascension and coming back with us to him. He's going to say, open those gates, you angels. I'm bringing my people with me. I got my host with me. I'm bringing them with me. And the angels open the gates for us. Bring us to glory. That's his joy. That's his joy to do that. So preparing us for glory, readying a seat for us at the marriage feast of the Lamb was what gave him great joy in the midst of his suffering. Am I doing that? Listen. His was the greatest suffering ever known to man. And even in the midst of it, 
He had unbelievable joy because he knew how it was going to end. And knowing the end result would be for us to be with him forever brought him joy even though he was the suffering servant. And so the saint's spiritual well-being ought to be what brings us joy even in our afflictions and distresses. Amen? Amen? Now, if you're here today and you're not saved, what you're lacking is faith. You don't have faith at all. And if you leave this life this way, your afflictions and distresses will be unbearable, unbearable in the next life. But the same God who saved the Thessalonian saints and every saint sitting in this room today can save yours as well. If you acknowledge your sin before him and you plead for forgiveness of them and turn from them to Christ, and that's what repentance is, is turning away from sin and turning to Christ, acknowledging I have a tremendous need and I can't fix it. And I'm condemned apart from you, Lord. And I deserve it, by the way. But I turn to Christ and I trust in Christ and I'm going to cling to Christ and I don't care what happens. I'm going with him. And if you acknowledge that, guess what? He will sincerely give you the gift of faith. He will save your soul. He will give you repentance. He will give you faith. And then all the saints here, well, they will rejoice for your sake before God. And then you'll rejoice with us for that as well. Amen? Repent and believe. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you for the good news of the faith of the saints, the good news that the gospel brings how it takes men and women from darkness to life. Lord, every man needs it. Most don't want it. Nobody wants it, Lord, apart from you changing their heart to want it. I pray that you would do that in this room. I pray that we who know you would be very thankful, thankful for what you're doing in our lives and the lives of the saints. And Lord, we would be thankful for spiritual things, for growth, for trust, uh, for, for, for long-suffering, uh, Lord, and, and not moving off uh, the truth of the gospel. Lord, I pray that we would be thankful as we see the saints grow and we would praise you for it. And Lord, again, for those who don't know you, Lord, would you put a real prick on their heart, Lord? Would you show them, Lord, that they need a Savior no matter what they think? Uh, Lord, without faith, it is impossible to please you. No man will know you without it. I pray, Father, that you would draw them to the cross and you give them life. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.